This is the decade of uncertainty. And I will tell you, these are not my words. These are the words of a leading global forecaster. Her name is Kristalina Georgina. She's the head of the International Monetary Fund and predicted the future back in January 2020 when she said, if I had to identify a theme at the beginning of this decade, it would be uncertainty. And how could she make that statement? Well, they had been working at the IMF on a major research project for about a year in advance of that statement, and they were about to release their World Uncertainty Index. And this is a leading risk indicator for all of us as to where we're headed. Now, this World Uncertainty Indicator, or WUI, includes data on 143 countries with at least 2 million in population. It comes from economic, or excuse me, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and they're reporting on these 143 countries across a range of data, including economy, policies, and politics in each individual country on a quarterly basis, and it measures 60 years. So a huge data set. And when this was published back in the beginning of 2020, this index was at its highest point in history. And this was just before the pandemic really took full force. And it continues to trend higher today and with greater vol volatility as Miss Georgina predicted. Now, when thinking about where we've been and where we're going, this visual that I have in front of you came to mind. And it has to do with the fact that I live in Atlanta, Georgia, in the southeastern United States, and love to go up to the Blue Ridge Mountains, which are about a two-hour drive north. And much like Richard Chambers, who described yesterday his affinity with meteorology, I'm a weather geek, huge weather geek. And it just so happened that my wife and I, my daughter, my dog, had planned to go up to the Blue Ridge Mountains on a Friday afternoon in Atlanta, Georgia. And if anyone here, I'm sure there are some who have been to Atlanta and experienced the wonderful traffic that we have. Friday afternoons are a bear, even compared to LA. And we were rushing to get everything in our car so we could get out of town and up the mountain. Well, <clears throat> the problem was I had checked detailed weather forecasts and was really prepared for a huge snowstorm that was going to hit. And in the south, <clears throat> we really don't get much snow, even up into the mountains. But this was going to be a major snowstorm. My wife, on the other hand, was more concerned with the traffic. She was looking at the you know, traffic indicators, seeing what was going on, certainly huge amount of traffic leading out of town. And so while I was rushing to try to get everything into the car, while my wife was you know, at a more leisurely pace, we were trying to kind of contend with each other, working off of different risk assessments, if you will, or risk indicators. Well, we finally got everything in and headed up the mountain, and lo and behold, as soon as we started to rise in elevation, the snowstorm hits. And as you can imagine, um, my wife, my daughter especially, she was fairly young at the time, maybe five or six, were super concerned as we headed up the mountain. About halfway up, I stopped. I was prepared. I'd thrown the, the tire chains in the back. I put on the tire chains. And we continued up, and lo and behold, we started to see cars on the left and the right, off into the ditches, certainly around the turns. As they sped into the turns, they just went straight off. My, my daughter was very afraid. But luckily, as we headed into those turns, we knew 
how treacherous it was. We also were prepared with those tire chains. We had a four-wheel drive vehicle, all-wheel drive vehicle, and simply accelerated up the mountain to our destination. Now, this is very similar to what we face today and what we've already faced. And it really goes to show there are two key elements that you need to keep in mind as an audit risk and compliance leader when you're headed up this mountain. The first is the fact there's going to be operational disruption, major operational disruption. And just like the snowstorm, we've already dealt with pandemic. We've dealt with the war in Ukraine, uncertainties with Ge geopolitics, also with supply chains, deglobalization, unstable, uh, unstable environments, and the fact that <clears throat> as you start to head into these turns of operational disruption, you've got to really slow down ahead of the turn and gain greater visibility and understanding of, of what you're headed into. And then on the other hand, <clears throat> organizations recognize We've got to navigate this turn and do it at speed so that we can be at an advantage and get through the turn safely and ahead of the cars that unfortunately met their fate. So just like navigating through that turn, accelerating out of it, we're seeing digital acceleration, not only in investment by companies, to make sure that they're heading out of these turns into a new future of new products and services that will be added growth for their companies and their stakeholders. But we also see the need for greater risk management using digital means and making sure that we can prepare for the health, the safety challenges that we may have with future pandemics, certainly sustainability challenges that we face with climate and the environment, but also within the business and sustaining their operations on a go-forward basis and growing at speed and maintaining that pace is huge. Getting up this mountain of uncertainty you need a special vehicle. And that vehicle needs to be equipped to give you greater risk visibility, looking into the future, but also greater risk understanding based on where you've been and what you've seen. It needs the ability to monitor, measure, and inform, both by current readings that you may have on your dashboard, but also future warnings that you may receive as new vehicles come equipped with heads-up displays. And we'll see more and more of this, I believe, uh, with the Teslas of the future and the, the other electronic, or excuse me, electric vehicles. What is coming ahead? How can we prepare? But this vehicle is simply an enabler. It's the way you're gonna get up the mountain, but the real answer lies in the ability to bring it all together with a combination of risk visibility and understanding that it takes to accelerate up that mountain safely. And the answer is not the vehicle itself. The answer is you as the audit risk and compliance leader. Well, as we all know, when you're seeking to get to a destination, you need to know where you're going, first and foremost. And that's why a successful risk management journey should always begin with the understanding of the business priorities. And those business priorities are shifting. What I have here before you is some results from a survey conducted this year by Gartner of board members and their view of their company's priorities heading into 2023. First and foremost, at the very top, is digital technology. And these board members, <clears throat> more than anyone else, know that digital is the way forward. 
Digital will provide organizations the means to grow at pace, to accelerate out of the turn, but also reach new customers, new markets in safer ways, in more sustainable ways. So that's why it's at the top. But it's quickly combined with number two and number three, workforce, ESG, health and sustainability, because it's all about what you bring to bear with the people and understanding how you're operating in the greater community in which you operate. Then comes growth and financial concerns, where in the past, previous d decades, that may not have been the case. They may have been higher up. But the most surprising fact was number six, and that's risk management. Risk management is a huge priority for companies today. And these priorities, not only do they exist on their own, they are highly connected. Again, it starts with digital, digital first. I'm sure you've heard that term in your environments. But using digital to be more efficient, to reach new markets, as I said, and to compete. But digital cannot truly be successful as an initiative without the supporting workforce, with the right skills and abilities to implement those new digital products and services. You also need ESG, or a focus on not only environment, but social concerns, as well as how your organization operates from a corporate governance perspective to attract and retain the workforce of today. It's extremely important to the highly skilled individuals that an organization has a high ESG rating. And not only talks the talk, but backs it up with real action. You also have to have a focus on how ESG, how digital, and the greater investments in those activities are fueling the growth of the company, especially as we are on the precipice of a major economic downturn. But as we come out of that economic downturn <clears throat> with an even greater focus on financial needs and cost management, what I have heard <clears throat> over the last three, four years, even before uh, talk of recession has come to the fore, is that CEOs, and I've talked to hundreds of CEOs at Gartner, they recognize, especially as it relates to digital and an ESG, that they are not equipped to understand these new risks that are being generated out of these activities. And not only are they not equipped, <clears throat> they readily admit that they have not invested in these activities like they should. And so risk management from this point forward is going to be an area of keen focus, not only at the board level, but at the senior executive level, all the way up to the CEO. And according to Gartner, Board of Directors have cited that the CEO, more than anyone else, not the CIO, not the CTO, not the CDO or Chief Digital Officer, it's the CEO who is the primary leader for driving digital business initiatives within the enterprise. So what are those CEOs really interested in as it relates to risk management? What are they seeking in greater investment they are looking for an integrated, practical approach to risk management that's coupled with a balanced view of risk. And coming out of Gartner, <clears throat> I've put together a model that I call the Integrated Risk Management Navigator, which I'm going to share with you today, and talk to you about how my conversations and research into the chief executive officer and that person's needs as it relates to risk management manifest in a more integrated approach to risk management. And it all starts in the CEO's mind 
with performance. The P of the practical risk approach and risk objectives. And the reason we start with performance is the fact that very often CEOs and their teams may not truly understand or consider the risk as it relates to their performance goals. And on the flip side, we as audit risk and compliance leaders and professionals, we don't fully understand where those performance goals meet execution and the risks in trying to achieve them. And not only for financial purposes, which is a large part of the focus because our corporate reporting is so heavily loaded with financial results, but more and more non-financial performance. And ESG is leading the way in creating a new integrated corporate report that will produce metrics not only for ESG, but for other risk areas that are super important to stakeholders. Things like quality, things like safety, that haven't been reported before. And that's where we need to step up. It also includes things like digital and third-party risk, the broader ecosystem of risk that most senior executives don't fully appreciate. Because over the last decade, if not more, as we all know, <clears throat> businesses have pushed more and more to the outside of the organization in the hands of third parties, whether it be offshoring, um, outsourcing, using technology vendors. Quickly on the heels of performance, CEOs need a better understanding from a resilience perspective, the R in the practical risk objectives. And resilience not only includes a focus on, as we all know, supply chain risk, because the supply chains have grown so complex and fragile and they span boundaries across the globe, so there's a whole re-fortification of supply chains, but it's looking at it from a business continuity perspective and how to create a risk playbook for effective response and recovery from a major risk event. And one of the major risk events that comes to mind this year, you may have heard of this, back in February, Toyota, <clears throat> they had a huge risk event whereby one of their major suppliers of parts, plastic parts for their cars, reported to Toyota that they had been a victim of ransomware. Now, Toyota, <clears throat> known for their very lean, um, tightly controlled manufacturing processes, instantly shut down all their production lines across all their manufacturing facilities in Japan for a full week. As you can imagine, <clears throat> the cost and lost revenue from that single event was huge. But their effective response <clears throat> and recovery from that event to ensure that it didn't grow into the full production lines at Toyota certainly offset whatever future loss that they may have experienced. So it's super important to have that playbook in hand and a playbook that is ready to be executed. And what I heard <clears throat> during the pandemic and talking to thousands of clients is the fact that they recognize that their business continuity plans really had gathered dust on the shelf. They had not been tested in any recent way or recent uh, time frame, and they did not reflect the extension of critical business processes into the broader ecosystem of third parties and suppliers. So one of the positives, I believe, coming out of the pandemic is there's a greater focus in the resilience realm. But then you come to the A of the risk objectives, and that's assurance. And this is where a lot of us get our bread and butter in making sure that our organizations are addressing the right risks in the right way. 
And then finally, the C of practical risk objectives is compliance. And compliance, <clears throat> I have at the end, because CEOs told me in my research that compliance is certainly important, but without an understanding of the first three, performance, resilience, assurance, compliance <clears throat> really adds very little value. Where compliance can add great value is by understanding the first three and the relevance of compliance to the business at large. And how things like IT, cybersecurity, are addressing risks in those most critical business processes. But even more important, what they told me was the fact that areas of non-compliance have to be identified much more quickly. And it all has to do with the shifting nature of regulation and the need to disclose these areas of non-compliance in a very short time frame. For example, GDPR, of course, any sort of privacy issue has to be disclosed in 72 hours. And that requires a lot of upfront work and coordination to be able to pull that off when it actually happens. Now that you have a better understanding of the four objectives and why they are practical in the mind of the CEO, I want to share with you how they're connected. And to be successful, these four risk objectives must be linked through greater risk visibility as well as through greater risk understanding. The visibility comes from a horizontal view of risk across three primary risk domains, technology and cyber risk, operational risk, and strategic or enterprise risk. And these three areas <coughs> have a very specific focus when it comes to risk assessment, and oftentimes, while it's very informative of the risk in that domain, it doesn't provide the full understanding that's necessary for real business decision making. And I think many of you will agree with what I'm about to say in that on the technology and cyber risk side, most risk assessments are focused on the asset, the technology asset. And the technology asset being hardware, software, data, and understanding what are the key threats to that asset, but also the inherent vulnerabilities that are part of the asset in their creation and maintenance on a go-forward basis. Now, a lot of times that will live on its own without any further context into how those assets are enabling specific business processes, and most importantly, the most critical business processes that organizations need to better understand from a resilience perspective. So there's a huge need to connect those asset-based risk assessments into a business process view. And then finally, <clears throat> there tends to be a weakness or a gap between understanding at the execution layer within those critical business processes how the strategic objectives or the broader enterprise view of risk is fueled and whether or not those activities are in alignment with the organization's risk appetite. And when those two things get out of sync, real problems can happen. And I've <clears throat> lived that as a risk management executive in the financial services industry going through the lead up to the global financial crisis and looking at the mortgage business within the bank that I um, held my position and having real tough conversations as Richard Chambers mentioned yesterday with my CEO and the head of the mortgage business 
on how the controls within that mortgage business were suffering and suffering from great weakness and the need to bolster those controls. And frankly, unfortunately, the CEO and the mortgage business lead and I did not see eye to eye. I actually had to make the decision to leave. But not only do you have to have that broader horizontal view and greater visibility of risk across the business, you need to couple that with a more vertical view of risk that are manifested in two key areas. At the top here, you have the products and services, and these are the key targets or creators or generators of risk that are driving the business forward. And that's where, as auditors, as risk managers, as compliance leaders, we need to start first in understanding where these products and services are taking us. Very similar to what I just mentioned with the mortgage business, where are those mortgage products and services taking us? Are we actually originating subprime loans but calling them something different? Are there greater risks in those products and services that aren't readily apparent? And then balanced with a view from a policies and procedures perspective on how you can keep the business on track. You know, what are the, the right controls and how strong do they need to be and how are they matched up with the risk appetite so that the folks in the boardroom at the senior executive level have that assurance that the right risks are being managed in the right way. This full integrated view will provide that context that I just described, but then also start to pull together the four risk objectives in specific risk areas and start to enable key business leaders to connect the dots. So for example, you've got specific risks that may be aligned with an objective more over another, but they're highly connected to other objectives. ESG risk, for example, it's gonna be a real challenge for organizations as they continue to produce the sustainability reports, what was it, 98% of the, the S&P 500 are producing sustainability reports, but as they truly get into the data and go from the scope one to scope two to scope three, broadening out the perspective of how key vendors, key suppliers are contributing to their metrics, they've got to understand that supply chain risk. They've got to understand the legal risk associated with having the appropriate remedies built into the contracts to make sure that they can drive the change that's necessary. But then you also have the connected challenges with vendor and third party risk from a performance realm. You know, you need those vendors and third parties to drive digital forward, but at the same time, you gotta make sure that they're compliant because uh, from an IT perspective, because their risks are really your risks. And so having that visibility and understanding and being able to act upon it is so crucial. What does that all mean for the folks that you need to continue to establish strong relationships with? Well, if you consider this IRM navigator model that I've described to you, you can start to imagine each of the key leaders and their relationship with one of these four objectives or the key risk domains or risk drivers that I described. So let me give you just an example here of how these leaders are focused in their role but need to have a greater understanding of their partner's role. So if you look here at the left, you've got the CEO, the board, and the chief audit executive really geared towards performance and assurance. You know, their focus is understanding the strategic and enterprise risk across the organization. At the same time, as we see here at the top, 
The CFO, the CDO, or chief digital, or you may want to refer to him as the chief data officer, and the chief operating officer, they're keenly focused on the products and services as they transition into more digital form, but also how they're performing and the ability to provide that resilience such that when an operational disruption occurs, they can quickly respond. You also have the perspective on the left-hand side here of the CPO, the chief procurement officer. You may also um, consider this because it's attached to resources, maybe the chief human resources officer, chief people officer in this realm, the CIO, and the CISO, the chief information security officer. More and more, they're partnering with the CEO, CDO, CFO, but more from a technology cyber risk perspective and understanding of how people are using those technological tools to enable the business. And then finally, at the bottom here, a real need for chief risk officers, chief legal, legal officers, chief compliance officers, to ensure that the right policies and procedures are in place on the compliance and the assurance side, that not only are they complying with the most relevant and key regulations, but the areas of non-compliance are addressed very quickly and effectively. So it really requires this whole team, though, I would say, to have this full, connected, balanced view of risk to connect the dots. And sadly, in some organizations, that's not the case. They only see a part of this picture. And that, I will tell you, is where the real risk resides, is not having this full understanding. Shifting gears a little bit, as you begin to talk and build new relationships with these executives and helping them gain a more integrated, balanced view of risk, you also have to start speaking in their terms. And what we have all been trained on and, and conditioned to focus on from a risk management perspective is the heat map. And so what I have before you here is, I'm sure, very familiar to each and every one of you, and that's <coughs> the heat map that helps us understand what are the high risks within the organization, what are the low risks in the organization, driven by both impact and likelihood. This is more of a tactical view that is necessary, and it, does, it cannot go away, but it is focused on loss minimization. And it's born out of the insurance industry in helping to drive residual risk to its lowest point. Now, I can say this with certainty. When I would present this to senior executives, their eyes would roll back in their head because they knew that unless you're in the insurance industry, this is not gonna help drive the business forward. While it may help you know, avoid those losses, it's not gonna help grow the business in any way. What they're really interested in is a more strategic view of risk that's focused on performance and resilience. And in that additional view, what they wanna talk about is how risk appetite or the amount of risk they're willing to take compares with the value of the activity that they're looking to engage in. And so the conversation goes from a high to low risk conversation to what's the good risk versus the bad risk. How can we be smarter about taking risk? And that's where really the conversation with them begins, and it starts to put it in a different context from what I would call the risk treatment plan, and a risk treatment plan being in place to drive, again, those losses down to zero, 
to more of a business case view and understanding of how risks fit into the set of opportunities that lie before the organization and how can either taking more risk or less risk allow the organization to move forward and move forward at an advantage to their competitors. And even more important than having these two perspectives of risk in mind and be able to communicate with them, business leaders all the way up to the CEO are so hungry for greater risk quantification. While the qualitative view is important, and as Richard Chambers said yesterday, risk management, is, risk management is certainly more art than science. There's no question that the stakes around some of these major risks and major business priorities are so incredibly high that these leaders need a better quantitative understanding of what's going on. And I'm just gonna share with you a few key statistics here on projected values and the amount of money that we're talking about that CEOs and others are, are looking at and seeing so much opportunity. One, you'll see here $1.8 trillion in worldwide digital transformation investment in 2022 alone. $12.6 trillion in global projected value of the Internet of Things or the connectedness of digital products and services, that's the amount that will be the market size in 2030, according to McKinsey. $53 trillion is the projected amount of ESG assets under management by 2025. This comes from Bloomberg. These are massive amounts of money that spell opportunity, but also come with great risk. And as these new priorities and opportunities emerge, innovation also needs to take place within our realm. And these new business priorities are driving key changes, key innovations and in new products and services, which relates to new levels of performance, new resources, as it relates to needing those greater skills within our own workforce, but also our broader supply chain and considering how those suppliers need to change where they're sourcing their work from. Are they doing it in socially responsible ways? Are they using forced labor, things of that nature? New attestations coming from the likes of ESG. And in ESG, <clears throat> Just to kind of give you an example here, in Europe, we've got the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive um, coming about with the first round of enforcement in 2024. But that is really the advent, in my mind, of truly forcing the issue on providing more of an integrated corporate report with non-financial metrics that are going to require formal attestations by the external auditor. And from internal auditor perspective, as well as risk and compliance professionals, that means <clears throat> greater focus from not only the external audit community, but also regulators and others. But then you think about <clears throat> other new standards and rules and the regulatory costs and penalties that come with that. Um, examples here include the Digital Services Act in the EU, which just today was formally published in the EU record. So that in 20 days, the Digital Services Act will be the law of the land across the European bloc, and the nations will begin to respond accordingly. This Digital Services Act, if you're not aware, provides the basis on which technology providers have to disclose and manage the risks around the data that they, that they own that are housed within their servers. <clears throat> and so any illegal content has to be managed by them, managed out. 
any um, algorithm, AI, has to be appropriately understood and the transparency made known to all the consumers. But not only the technology providers, but as more and more companies in and of themselves become technology providers in this new world of digital, it's gonna to apply to many, many more businesses. The other regulatory costs and penalties that <clears throat> will get the notice of key business leaders in the US is the SEC clawback that was just also announced today. It was approved by the SEC. It was proposed back in 2015, but they just approved it. And that will enforce companies to claw back compensation from executives related to their financial performance bonuses if it relates to any financial misstatement whether it be in the current year or prior years. So much more expansive than anyone thought. And I will tell you, it's gonna have further reach because as we all know, financial performance and financial misstatements are driven in many cases by operational faults. But when those penalties start to get really close to home for executives, you see a huge change in behavior. So I would uh, suggest you be on the lookout for that and how things are gonna change moving forward. These new business priorities all point to future risk and creating new demand for connected technology that can tie these risks together, but more importantly, inform better business decision making. And it's very similar, going back to my initial analogy, to the car and the driver. You know, the car provides all sorts of information, will provide a lot more information into the future, but it's the driver that makes all the difference in understanding how these things relate to one another. And it really comes in the form of connected risk. And connected risk, I will tell you, is the combination of people and technology in managing risks and providing greater visibility and understanding of those risks. And as you saw here at this event with the unveiling of the Connected Risk Dashboard, that information is critical, again, to making superior business decisions. But I'll tell you the dashboard is just the start. The dashboard much like a car, <clears throat> tells you what's happening today. What you really also need to have in place is the understanding of what's coming ahead. And so, similar to innovations in electric vehicles and others with heads-up displays, with a windshield view of what's coming, that's what's coming with Audit Board. More focus on leading risk indicators like the World Uncertainty Index, but also leading risk indicators that are specific to your own risk profiles. And pulling those together in a way that gives you the ability to action. And that's the real difference. And in fact, this is how I view it. By connecting risk in this way, you will not only you, you will take your organization to go beyond simply expecting the unexpected to embracing the unexpected. And it's those leaders and organizations that embrace the unexpected, that are prepared for the unexpected, that are gonna speed through the turns, pass the other cars who are in the ditch, and be at a greater advantage. I wanna thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you've enjoyed this event. Thank you.